Welcome to this evening, celebrating Walter Frisch's new book on Harold Arlen and his songs. Can I be heard? Is this, oh, it's okay? Okay. Uh, when I was fortunate enough to introduce Walter's last book about Harold Arlen, which was Arlen and Harburg's Over the Rainbow, I was given 10 minutes to speak at the beginning, but today I will be introducing only, uh, is that because this is a littler book and this is a bigger book today? This is the book today that I'm sure you've all seen. Uh, so I'll be introducing our distinguished panel. Uh, Walter Frisch, the author of the book, is the H. Harold Gum, Harry and Albert von Tilzer Professor of Music at Columbia, where he has taught since 1982. Uh, he's been a guest professor, guest lecturer all over the world. Uh, and his writings have been translated into French, German, Spanish, Italian, Japanese, and Chinese. Uh, he's a specialist in music of composers from uh, the Austro-German sphere from in the 19th and 20th centuries uh, and an American popular song, which enables him to make wonderful comparisons between Arlen and Brahms uh, in the book under discussion. His books include German modernism, music in the arts, music in the 19th century, and Arlen and Harburg's Over the over the Rainbow, that's just the most recent part of the 21st century in his books. Uh, he's now working on a book about the classic French film musical, The Umbrellas of Cherbourg, uh, for which he spent a year at the Columbia Institute for Ideas and Imagination in Paris. Uh, he also brought uh, Stephen Sondheim to speak in his undergraduate uh, the American musical class uh, and has given remarkable talks, which have taught me so much. Uh, I won't be responding to his book, but I can say the sensitive and accessible analyses and the poignant discussion of late style uh, were real standouts to me. Uh, then uh, Kevin Falez, uh, Associate Professor of Music and Ethnomusicology at Columbia, uh, who works on the relationship between the social and the aesthetic uh, as articulated in music and sound. He's written on a wide range of music from fusion uh, which was his first book, Birds of Fire, Jazz, Rock, Funk, and the Creation of Fusion, uh, and Hawaiian Music. Uh, his second book was uh, Listen But Don't Ask Question, Hawaiian Slack Key Guitar Across the Trans-Pacific, uh, which enabled him to be a great interlocutor for Walter's book on Over the Rainbow with its uh, ukulele version uh, sung by Izzy. Uh, and he's currently working on the sounds of anthropogenic activity in the ocean and its impact on uh, the more than human. Uh, Robert G. O'Mealy, the Zora Neale Hurston Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia, has served on the faculty for 25 years. Uh, the founder and director of the, the absolutely essential uh, Center for Jazz Studies at Columbia, uh, Bob is the author of The Craft of Ralph Ellison, Lady Day, The Many Faces of Billie Holiday, uh, The Jazz Singers, and Romare Bearden, A Black Odyssey. Uh, he's edited uh, volumes, include uh, The Jazz Cadence of American Culture, Living with Music, Ralph Ellison's Essays on Jazz, History and Memory in African American Culture, The Norton Anthology of African American Literature, and Barnes and Noble's editions of Mark Twain, Herman Melville, and Frederick Douglass. Uh, he's also uh, no, was nominated for Grammy uh, for the production of a Smithsonian record set called The Jazz Singers. Uh, and in a more personal to the music department note, uh, Billie Holiday is now in the core curriculum. Uh, we study her in Music Humanities uh, and Bob's work on her, in her. His book is a tremendous addition. Uh, he brought Ellington's Such Sweet Thunder to Miller Theater uh, and brought Othello to the Shakespeare reading in Literature Humanities, where he also teaches. Uh, our fourth speaker will not only speak, uh, Eric Comstock, a celebrated interpreter uh, of the American Songbook, uh, weaves together story and song in sparkling performances that move his uh, audiences. And that's why there is a keyboard here uh, on the table. Uh, resident artist at Birdland Jazz Club, he and Barbara Fasano, who is also here tonight, uh, will release their CD, Painting the Town, featuring tenor sax legend Houston Person in early 2025. Uh, and he sings a duet with her on her award-winning Harold Arlen CD, Written in the Stars. He's appeared at all the major uh, halls, Carnegie Hall Jazz at Lincoln Center and so forth, and has received numerous awards, and you can hear him on uh, radio and television. So uh, with this distinguished panel, I will subside and 
Uh, look at my watch. <laughs> anyway, let me turn the floor over to Walter Frisch. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, can everybody hear me okay? All right. So uh, first of all, thanks to this very distinguished panel for coming together uh, to uh, discuss my work. I'm really honored. And there's other people in the room who to whom I owe a lot. Um, and I do want to call out my Oxford University Press editor, Norm Hershey, without whom this book would not exist. He's great at pushing, pushing us, encouraging us, and pushing us ahead. And so I'm very grateful. So what I'm going to do is read a little bit from the preface to my book and then show a couple of very short videos that I think demonstrate some things. So in the fall of 2018, I was invited to attend a small reception in New York hosted by a friend. And actually, that friend is here tonight, so I should out him, Anthony Tomasini, Tony Tomasini, um, who had published the book. But um, I was there, and he said, knowing of my... Tony said, knowing of my work on Harold Arlen, he told me that a great admirer of the composer would be present, Stephen Sondheim. I brought along a copy of the book I had recently written on Over the Rainbow, which you just saw, with the hope of giving it to Sondheim at an opportune moment. When such a moment came, I introduced myself. We had met many years earlier. As Elaine said, he once came to my musical theater class. But I'm not sure he remembered. Um, his eyes lit up as I presented him the book, and he became animated as we chatted about Arlen. He told me proudly that Arlen had attended the original production of Pacific Overture several times, um, despite being disabled by Parkinson's disease. I knew that already from some of the Sondheim literature. When I presented my book on Over the Rainbow to Sondheim, he astonished me by raising it to his lips and kissing it. And he looked at me directly and he said, with a glint in his eye, that's for Harold Arlen, not for you. I cannot be sure that Sondheim ever read my book or whether I would have earned even a fraction of the affection he held for Arlen's music. But his spontaneous gesture was enough to reassure me that I was on a worthwhile journey. That journey had become some ten year, begun some 10 years earlier when I took off my shelf a book I had long owned but not read closely. Alec Wilder's idiosyncratic but keenly insightful American popular song, The Great Innovators, 1920 to 1950, originally published in 1972, but recently published in a new edition by uh, Oxford University Press, a revised edition. I was drawn into the long chapter on Harold Arlen. I had been familiar with only a few of Arlen's best known songs like Stormy Weather and Over the Rainbow, but now found myself reading about many other numbers. Wilder reveres Arlen. He inscribed a copy of his book to the composer, quote, for Harold Arlen, I can only say what I've said over and over again in these pages. I love you in every last note you've ever written or shall write, Alec Wilder, unquote. In the book, Wilder almost apologetically elevates Arlen above Gershwin. Quote, he says, I've carefully examined the music of both composers without prejudice. I respect Gershwin, but I envy Arlen. Comments like these, and there are many more in Wilder's chapter, piqued my interest, and I began to sense there was much more to discover, that Arlen's greatness might be hiding in plain sight. Although Arlen's name is not as familiar to the general public as some of his peers, his songs have long been championed by distinguished composers like Sondheim and Andre Previn, as well as by great vocalists, including Ethel Waters, Judy Garland, Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett, Barbara Streisand, and Audra McDonald. I purchased the two available Harold Arlen songbooks, this is one of them here, and began to acquire other sheet music, published and unpublished from libraries and from generous collectors and musicians with whom I became acquainted. I tracked down many of the probably thousands of recordings made of Arlen's songs, and I wrote uh, uh, an analytical article about Arlen's so-called tapeworm songs, the long ones, and a short book about Over the Rainbow, each is a kind of down payment on a larger study of Arlen's work that I knew had to be pursued. Arlen has been well served by three biographies, two of them written by his friend and amanuensis, Edward Jablonski, and one more recently by Walter Rimler. Although all devote some attention to Arlen's music, beyond Wilder's chapter, there's been no sustained critical or analytical discussion of his songs. And that is the goal of my book. It traces a roughly chronological trajectory through Arlen's career. It includes biographical information, which I draw partly from 
Jablonski and Rimler and have supplemented with or verified from other sources where appropriate. But my focus is on the songs which form the best network through which Arlen's life and career can be understood. A basic premise of this book, despite its title, is that Harold Arlen's songs are not his, but as the composer himself frequently acknowledged, theirs. Created with some of the finest lyricists of the 20th century, including Ted Kohler, Yip Harburg, Johnny Mercer, Ira Gershwin, and Dorothy Fields. One shortcoming of Wilder's book, something that justifiably annoyed, annoyed Harburg and Ira Gershwin, was that he rarely discusses the lyrics, never includes them in the musical examples and so forth. I hoped to redress this balance as well as another. When recreated by vocalists, Arlen's songs are also theirs and in, in an important sense. While the main focus is on the songs, I also consider where appropriate their placement in films and shows, especially in the book musicals Bloomer Girl, St. Louis Woman, and House of Flowers, in films like The Wizard of Oz and A Star is Born, where the music is an integral part of the story. In the case of some shows, including St. Louis Woman and Softly, a musical that was never finished, I, prov I provide deeper context by incorporating sources that have not been previously discussed. Um, what I'd like to do now uh, to end my uh, thing is uh, show you two short video clips uh, that both reflect the kind of sources I worked with, um, partly video, but also reflect uh, what I think is very special, but certain special qualities of Arlen. I already mentioned his, uh, his sense as a collaborator working with lyricists. And the first is a clip. Uh, he was interviewed uh, by Walter Cronkite in a show broadcast in February 1964, the complete uh, uh, show was about the songs of Harold Arlen. And I think you can see in this little clip um, how humble he is, but also how uh, how much he stresses the role of collaborators in creating his songs. So this is a little clip from his uh, talk. You see, that there's something about songwriting that's terribly uh, mysterious. It's not a tune. It isn't. It isn't my composition that you remember, if I can put it that personally. If you say, uh, if you sing, dee 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 da 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 da, you won't do what I just did. You will subconsciously think of somewhere over the rainbow or sing it or some phrase in it. Well, somebody wrote that. And those little, um, phrases uh, are what make, not just those little phrases, but they are, those are the memorable things that stand out and cling to a song and make it a happy wedding. And uh, most writers that we were talking about just don't understand that. It's two, two people get together and have an idea. Now it has to be wedded perfectly. In my case, I always carry a piece of manuscript with me. I've done that ever since I started when I knew I was going to be in trouble. I, it wasn't a, a one writing uh, fella, one song writing fella, you know. It was a fellow who had to write song after song after song for show. So I started to keep a, my jotter. And... Um, so uh, we got jotted on there right now. Well, I have a a story that's unmentionable, <laughs> and uh, a few notes of a lead uh, that might provoke uh, some development later, somewhere, sometime. Now, where where did this idea come to you? Walking, most always. But when I walk, I I do get ideas. They may not be usable, may not work, but I do find myself, um, the momentum, the rhythm of it sets up something in me where I do get ideas. And if I can find a wall where nobody's looking, I take out the manuscript and put, put it down. I talk you see about, that? He called There's something about songwriting that's terribly uh, mysterious. <laughs> it's not a tune. 
Um, I, I talk about some of those jots, which some of which survive. He called them jots, these sketches. Um, so you could, um, he gave quite a number of interviews. I think I tracked down most, not all of them that I could find, and always super interesting, super articulate um, about the craft of songwriting. And the second clip I'd like to show, so one of the things that I celebrate, if that's the word, right word in the book, is Arlen was an amazing performer of his own songs as a pianist and as a singer. I mean, he started his career, actually. Well, he was an arranger, but he he fronted for many bands in the late 20s and 30s as a kind of crooner, had a wonderful sort of high tenor voice, but he kept singing throughout his career, mainly his own songs. And um, this is a, a special feature. There's many recording. He made a number of uh, commercial LPs. He appeared on television a lot. And um, uh, and people often commented when they heard him, they said, you sing as though you wrote those words, as though you wrote the lyrics, which he almost never did. I mean, occasionally he did. And, and you know, that was the way he, you know, could uh, capture the spirit of a song with the lyrics, that so-called happy wedding. At any rate, um, i just show you one clip from the Ed Sullivan Show. I don't know, probably... Not too many people here remember the Ed Sullivan show, The Beatles. Um, uh, he appeared on it several times and twice in 1954, which is the year that A Star is Born, the Judy Garland film was coming out. And uh, he introduced the song, The Man That Got, His, uh, the Man that Got Away, probably the most famous song of the show, um, in June, actually well before the film came out. And then in October, I'm going to play you this clip he uh, did on the Ed Sullivan Show in October, just as the film was being released. And I believe the album had already been released, so people were becoming familiar with it and Judy Garland's interpretation. And you get some sense uh, you know, of him as a pianist and singer. I'll just play part of this song. It's one of these tapeworms that goes on for a while. But it's actually quite touching. Just as he sits down at the piano, he mutters. You can hear it if, if you listen for it. I hope Judy is listening because this was October October 54, just as the film was coming out. Do you get some some sense of his qualities as a performer of his own music. So a little bit of that. Hope oh, Judy's listening. <laughs> the night is bitter. The stars have lost their glitter, the winds grow colder. Suddenly you're older and all because of the man that got away. No more his eager call. The riding is all alone. You dreamed have all gone astray. The man that won you has run off and undone you. That great beginning, seen the final ending, don't know what happened. It's all crazy. You've been through the mill and never a new love will be the same. That's just the first part of the song. It's very long. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll I'll turn it over to my distinguished colleagues. Um, first, I want to say uh, what an honor it is to be here to such a illustrious co-panels. Um, it's also a privilege to be able to speak and spend some time discussing this latest book by my colleague and friend Walter um, Frisch, who I want to thank for including me in today's present celebration of is astute reading of Har Harold Arlen's oeuvre. While there's much to admire here, I would like to focus on a central theme in the book. This is Walter's argument that Arlen was a craftsman of the highest order. And like master craftsmen in any pursuit, and yes, I'm aware of the gendered language I'm using here, is able to transform what might be mundane materials or tasks into objects of sustained beauty and quality. Let me be clear, I'm not arguing, nor am I implying that Walter is either, 
that these works stand the test of time, as it were, or a testament to a universal timeless sensibility regarding musical beauty. What I am saying is that Walter gives us the tools to recognize and hear the ways in which Arlen took, for instance, the AAB, AABA form from his Tin Pan Alley predecessors and extended, stretched, and manipulated it, creating what Arlen called tapeworms that can maintain listeners' interests beyond the context in which they were first created. As Arlen himself put it, and I'm quoting uh, from the book, uh, quote, I don't think I'm trying to be different. Sometimes I get into trouble. In order to get out of trouble, I break the form. I start twisting and turning, get into another key or go 16 extra bars in order to resolve the song. And often as not, I'm happier with the extension than I would have been trying to keep the song in regular form, end quote. Walter stays with Arlen's various twistings and turnings to illustrate the myriad ways the composer's irregularities form the basis of his successful and popular creations. That Arlen's songs are still listened to by countless members of the listening public and continues to inspire singers and cabarets and concert halls today is testament to the ways in which attention to craft undergirds the lasting appeal of his music. As Walter notes on the first page, the fact that as recently as 2000, over the Rainbow was voted the greatest song of the 20th century in a survey conducted by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Recording Industry Association of America, attests to the enduring appeal of Arlen's compositions. I applaud Walter's focus on the ways in which Arlen's sense of musical craft drove him to produce works that are not merely functional in terms of serving a musical's plot or illuminating the character's interior thoughts or feelings, but they can also stand as exemplary works of musical art on their own. Some songs are delightfully clever, as Walter points out in his analyses of Get Happy and Buds Won't Bud, with Arlen offering listeners melodic lines that underpin the witty lyrical illusions of his lyricist collaborators, while other songs achieve a poignancy such as Over the Rainbow and It's Only a Paper Moon that belies their use in commercial vehicles. Many of Arlen's songs do both, as Walter elucidates in his thoughtful considerations of The Man That Got Away and One for My Baby and One for the Road. I also want to note that early in the book, Walter provides a musical lesson for readers unfamiliar with technical musical terms in his analysis of Over the Rainbow that is a model of concision, ably compressing the lessons given in the initial weeks of an elementary music theory course into a few pages using the song as a prompt for illustrative examples of each term. For readers unacquainted with the musical terms used in formal music theory for both classical music as well as jazz, these introductory remarks should eliminate any hes hesitancy to engage with the musical analyses that follow. This, I should say, is not an easy task, and thus not a usual one for books on popular song. A significant element in high quality craftsmanship is an attention to detail. As Walter demonstrates throughout the book, Arlen and his lyrical collaborators were not simply adroitly intuitive artists, but were engaged with the slightest details of their songs, weighing musical and lyrical decisions no matter the circumstance. Lyricist Leo Robin, who collaborated with Arlen, admired the composer's workmanlike attitude, characterizing him as a, quote, very conscientious craftsman to whom everything he writes is important, end quote. Focusing on the craft of musical production is not as prevalent in popular music studies as someone outside the field might think. And Walter's book can stand as an exemplary case study of how to highlight the craft behind an aesthetic approach in popular song. As Walter demonstrates throughout Harold Arlen and his songs, Arlen was consistent in actively thinking about the shape of a melodic line, its harmonization, and settling on musically sound of irregular musical structures, resulting in a corpus of idiosyncratic, but definitely not eccentric compositions. Walter's write, writing had me revisiting a lot of Arlen's songs, which I've loved since I was a youngster, or introduced me to some songs I'd never heard before. It took me longer than it should have to read through Walter's insightful and well-written book, because on reading a passage about a particular melodic line's role in emphasizing a lyric or is pointing to a rhythmic or harmonic irregularity that somehow made the song work as a vehicle for expressing a certain feeling or thought, I was compelled to go and listen to the song, often repeatedly, to listen for the particularities he brought to my attention. It was, to be honest, a joy to listen to Arlen's own recordings while reading through Walter's fascinating analyses, as well as to return to cherished recordings by Ethel Waters, Judy Garland, Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett, and Barbara Streisand, among others. 
gaining an added layer of appreciation and pleasure thanks to Walter's enlightening observations. New songs to me included With the Sun Warm Upon Me, an online collaboration with Dorothy Fields that draws on the loping rhythm of cowboy song to convey the optimism of a mythical, if not fantastical, vision of the frontier. But the new song I found the most incredible was I Never Has Seen Snow. I must have re-listened to Diane Carroll's version of the 1955 cast recording a couple of dozen times the first time I queued it up, listening and following Walter's breakdown, including all of the backstage machinations Walter depicts in telling the story of the creation of House of Flowers, the stage show in which the song forms a critical dramatic juncture. I want to end by brief remarks by noting that there are numerous other attractions in the book. Accompanying the formal analyses, Walter gives us a peek into the close collaborative work Arlen and various lyricists conducted under varying labor conditions. He also treats with care the collaborations of Black musicians without shying away from the use of tropes, musical and topical, that many would find uncomfortable today in Arlen and lyricist Ted Kohler's early commercial work for the Cotton Club in the 1930s, and that continued to crop up in his work, including some two decades later in House of Flowers. Despite the occasional use of not problematic themes or tropes, more often driven by lyricists or producers, Arlen is clearly indebted to the blues, though here too he twisted and turned its forms into tapeworms that extended and enhanced the idiom. While avoiding hagiography, Walter is explicit in his admiration and enjoyment of Arlen's music, though he remains a discerning critic, inserting the occasional evalu evaluative remark that is less than celebratory. Truman Capote's shortcomings as a lyricist, for example, come under withering critique, though if the examples are an indication, not without reason. In conclusion, Harold Allen and his songs is a worthy addition to any music lover's library, particularly if you're a fan of the great American songbook, musicals, and popular song more broadly. Walter makes a formidably convincing argument for a wider appreciation of Allen, the composer, who, according to Walter Cronkite in a 1964 broadcast devoted to the composer, was, quote, a shy retiring man, which perhaps explains the paradox of his fame. People know and love his music, but they do not know his name, end quote. With his new book, Walter helps to ensure that Arlen's name and musical legacy will not only be remembered, but justly celebrated as well. Thanks. Thank you. I want to say first that, as you've heard, I'm a ringer in this company, uh, not a member of the music department, but uh, happy to be affiliated with the Center for Jazz Studies, of which Kevin is the director now. And um, I'm a member of the English department and African-American studies. And so I've been working, working outside of my corridor with great joy, and especially when affiliated with my colleagues in music. Um, this is a wonderful book, and I'm glad to be able to be part of its its uh, celebration. Um, what what I find is that it's possible to read some of the analytical material that I'll also read a bit of as a sort of poetry, uh, and as somebody who's not really trained in in analytical or music analysis in that way. Uh, I I've been, was able to uh, learn so much from what I could understand and also what I could gather from the poetry. Um, you literally made me take out my saxophone, which has been a long time. And then I had to hear uh, my, my, the, the wife, my, my, my wife's, uh, the click of the door as she quietly. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun to, to, have your book in front of me and to read some of those uh, melody, you know, melodic lines. Uh, and just uh, consider this, uh, blues in the night, let's fall in love, stormy weather, the devil in the deep blue sea, my shining hour, hooray for love, this time the dream's on me, that old black magic, I've got the world on a string, let's take a walk around the block, ill wind, accentuate the positive when the sun comes out. And I've just read the first half of the Ella Fitzgerald Harold Arlen songbook. This is a fantastic a body of material, an unbelievable achievement. Uh, and I, I, I was thinking when you, uh, when, when I read uh, 
uh, that uh, uh, Wilder would prefer uh, uh, Arlen to Gershwin. I'm sure that if I were running out of the house with only one to grab, I would have to get the Arlen. I couldn't do without uh, Come Rain or Come Shine or some of these other uh, uh, wonderful pieces. And now that I've had this Ella songbook on repeat, I'm, I'm very, I'm especially uh, thankful uh, to to Walter. I'm also reminded of how great a singer Ethel Waters was. And you go back and and hear her happiness is just the thing called Joan. You can hardly believe what she's doing. And so that's been another wonderful part of this, this experience. As somebody in, in literature, I was also reminded uh, since Harold Arlen's father was a cantor uh, in, in Jewish tradition, I was reminded of Gene Toomer's saying in Cain that when he heard the songs of the Black singers in the South, they were so moving. And then he says, if you've ever heard a Jewish cantor sing, you know what I mean when I say that it was, it was tremendously moving. And so I was just, just re reminded of this and, and struck by your saying, uh, uh, contradicting those who would make too fixed uh, or too ready an explanation of Arlen's skill as an improviser uh, in terms of this this background. He says, yeah, that, that, that's part of it there, but but they're, they're more important links to the, to the Cantor uh, tradition, the, 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 the playfulness and other and other aspects of the singing that that he uh, talks about. I had loved um, Wilder's book, the best I've read on uh, Harold Arlen, but now we have a much better book. Um, if you, it, it's deep in its footnotes, it's more of an anthology than a single volume. There's so much song by song. You can go to the footnotes, and then there are links to the internet. So it's it's a it's a really wonderfully complete uh, experience. We learn about Arlen and lyricists, Arlen and singers, Arlen as collaborator. Uh, Arlen is singer. I, I, I had I hadn't known before this this book about that, but also Arlen is a composer who's working for specific venues and with for specific people, and that's part of what I, I I don't have time to go into. But it struck me that of the the importance of the American Songbook and how like Strayhorn and Ellington. He was writing for the movies and he's writing for the stage and he's writing for American situations of all kinds. And so the, the, the American songbook that he created is a fantastic treasury. And we're just learning, as you're saying, to pay as much attention to that as we do to Mozart. And it's not the same attention. I'd like you to hear you, you talk more about what you mean when you say it's not quite the same. Uh, Arlen said that, said they were, but not, but we do need to look closely, and, and that's uh, what you do. And what, what, what I especially like here is that you don't shy away from close reading. In, in literature, we talk about close reading all the time. That's where things start. The theory, if, it, if the theory doesn't emerge from the, the, the art itself, then you're doing something else. You're, you're talking about something that somebody else did and Foucault again, and okay, but let's get back to the to the work itself, and that's what you do uh, so deeply. But you don't ignore the content or the the surroundings either. The the the, the imperative always to historicize is something that you have in mind. So you don't just look at a Cotton Club song without remembering this is a segregated club with lots of problems all around. And and we have to consider uh, uh, those, those those contexts, but meanwhile you give us a new language, um, patter, tapeworms we've heard of, uh, many tapeworms you talk about. You talk about his particular breaks and extensions that are part of the original song form as he conceived it. You you talk about the Broadway spiritual. You're, you're beginning to give us or extending. What, what others too have, have, along with David Hayview, given us as, as a language for talking about these songs um, in the terms that send us back to the songs uh, themselves. His background in jazz arranging 
led him to be more thorough is another term that, that you emphasize than other composers and notating these kinds of effects. He was a composer partial to vocal leaps, the somewhere uh, that, that I can't, I couldn't do it on the saxophone or with my voice. <laughs> and he loved dissonant harmonies and was very playful. At sometimes he could be very, very economical though, but he also could be very playful with chromatic details and, and blue notes. Um, you get here readings of certain songs and I love that there are readings of the singers doing those songs and the sense of collaboration at every turn. It's it's a Frank Sinatra song, it's a Tony Bennett, it's it's a treatment by, by uh, Ella Fitzgerald and that's a part of the story. I wanna emphasize something that Kevin brought out about the blues. Uh, just growing up in DC and listening to the radio and trying to play that saxophone and doing other thing, I thought Stormy Weather was a blues. And I, I thought Blues in the Night uh, was a blues. One of the first versions I heard of it was by Bobby Blue Bland, and he goes way down into the into the sense of the blues. Uh, Sterling Brown was my colleague when I taught at Howard, and he wrote that there's there's a fake Hollywood blues. He says in the fake Hollywood blues, uh, th there's there's plenty of humor, and the uh, Oh, no, 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 there's sadness and there's humor that's feigned. But Sterling says that in the real blues, the pain is real and the humor is feigned. And in, in, in Harold Arlen, you get something closer to the real thing. And no wonder Billy Holiday and others like to get into the blue bland is cutting no corners as he sings these songs which have a great deal of pain in them, but also part of the American songbook, this let's take a walk around the block, let's accentuate the positive when the sun comes out, or is also shining through those songs. There's another chorus coming, uh, uh, even though uh, you, you, everything I had is gone, is what the Blues in the Night says. There's a bottomless sense of tragedy that that is part of this tradition, but also so is this uh, the sunniness. I was reminded that when my, my parents met, my mother tells the story that they didn't have any money and they, they, they wanted to go out on a date. But And finally she said, let's take a walk around the block. <laughs> and um, that was in the late 30s before the song uh, had, had, had come out, uh, before the song was well known. It had been uh, in, in, a, in a show that I'm sure she didn't see. It was later in the 50s. On the, on the, but the fact that she looked at her experience back through that 50s song that Harold Arlen had created is, 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 is something uh, wonderful for, for me to remember. So I think it's important to think of all these collaborators, the venues, the, the vividness of the blues, the songbook as a, as a wall of material that we, we still need to, to, to hear thoroughly. Thanks for the magical moments. We're told about a moment when Harold Arlen says to Mrs. Arlen, let's go to Grauman's Chinese Theater, I said. You drive the car, I don't feel too well right now. I wasn't thinking of work. I wasn't conscious of thinking of work. I just wanted to relax. And we drove by Schwab's drugstore on Sunset. And I said, would you pull over, please? And she knew what I meant. We stopped, and I really don't know why. Bless the muses, I took out my little piece of uh, a manuscript paper and put down what you now know as over the rainbow. <laughs> of course, it needed Mr. Harburg's lyric. There are other backstories. Uh, we're told that the, in the uh, uh, originally the producers of the show wanted to, of Wizard of Oz wanted to cut somewhere over. They couldn't imagine why this girl, why Dorothy is singing a standing in a farmyard singing this dreamy song. Uh, so it's 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 shocking to hear that it was almost cut uh, entirely. It's great to learn that he wrote for Cabin in the Sky, that important movie for so many black performers who get a showcase there. Again, it's it's incredible to meet Ethel Waters again. We know her as an actor and this and that. She was an unbelievable singer, uh, called the mother of us all for 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 good reason. I, I want to. Uh, 
end by just saying that um, we get this to poetic, this technical language, and I want to emphasize that it's also, you can ride on the poetry of the vivid language, even if you're not getting all of it, you'll get a sense of what he's doing. When he's talking about happiness is just a thing called Joe, called Joe. Here's, here's a Walter. Uh, he says, uh, the phrase troubles fly away, tilts toward the flat side, ending on a B flat sixth chord. After these 12 measures of A prime, despite the variations in the tune and harmony, we expect the next phrase to be the final one of a 16 measure A prime. But this is where Arlen's tapeworm instinct kicks, kicks in. Although he brings the harmony around to the tonic C, the voice pauses on the note above D, which is approached from a blue note E flat, all I need to know. This gesture leaves us in the air, feeling the song cannot end there. And so Arlen fashions yet another four measure phrase to bring the tune firmly home to C, just the thing called Joe. But the story is not yet over. That earlier melodic D was just a foretaste or a kind of faint. In a second ending to the chorus, Arlen cadences on the melodic C, then adds an eight measure coda that spirals up to and concludes on the high D, which earlier formed the climax of the song. And so it's, it's that kind of, you see what I mean? You can ride with them and, 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 and you want to go get that. You want to hear that, those rides and those pauses and everything else. And so we're, we're very grateful for your work. Eric. Thank you. I too am a ringer. This is my first academic paper, so please be kind. My fellow Arlenians and aficionados, in our lifetimes, golden age songwriters such as Berlin, Wishwin, Kern, and Porter have been celebrating books, centennial concerts, PBS documentaries, and perhaps too many cabaret acts. Well beyond that, the Epstein were saluted in 1954 with an all-star tribute carried by all four major networks, sponsored unironically by General Foods. This is my way of saying I'm grateful that Walter Frisch has put his passion for the quirky, courageous canon of Harold Arlen in writing, and I'm sure both Harold Arlen and Alec Wilder would be thrilled. One of the unique things about Walter's book is, as you've heard, he links Arlen with another maverick, Stephen Sondheim. Sondheim made clear to Walter he adored Arlen's work, and Sondheim could be famously ungenerous about his colleagues, including even his mentor and surrogate father, Oscar Hammerstein II. On the surface, they would seem quite different. Arlen, the jazz pianist turned composer of Blues in the Night and dozens of sensuous, romantic love songs that seem to have been around forever. And Sondheim, American musical theater's man of the moment, spiky, unsentimental, with nary a blue note. To me, however, they were both outsiders on the inside. What do I mean by this? Sondheim entered the Broadway pantheon as a lyricist while still in his 20s, with West Side Story and Gypsy, yet... His composing and post-psychiatric sensibility were labeled chilly and cynical until later productions showed that he composed with his heart as well as his prodigious IQ. Arlen was definitely in the club in playing his new songs for Berlin and Negotians after tennis matches in Beverly Hills. The brand new his friends became, well, though his number of pop, pop hits rivals theirs. There may have been some East Coast chauvinism here. Uh, Arlen had two Broadway hits, Bloom a Girl in Jamaica, and some of the songs he wrote for his unsuccessful shows became beloved standards, of course, Welcome to Come Shine and others from the glorious score of St. Louis Woman. But the writers who succeeded more often on Broadway became the recognized names. And though maybe the song can possibly compete with the Oscar winning magic and popularity of Over the Rainbow, Arlen spent a lot of his career as a composer of often wonderful songs for 
often mediocre films. Walter is no snob. He has sat through just about everything. How many folks have sidled up to my piano and requested, it's quarter to three, or set him up Joe? Of course, they mean one for my baby, but they know not its title, nor its composer, nor it was introduced in a forgotten World War II film by none other than Fred Astaire. Another factor in his relative anonymity is Moody's tendency to work with multiple lyricists rather than from a one marketable team. His taste in collaborators, of course, was impeccable, and Arlen was all of them, their due. Certainly an element that set Arlen apart from his colleagues was his ease with African-American music and culture, far ahead of the American public at large. Only Arlen could claim an important role in the careers of, here's a dazzling list for you, Ethel Waters, Lee Horn, Avon Long, Harold Nicholas, Pearl Bailey, Dooley Wilson, Alvin Ailey, Jeffrey Holder, Carmen de la Arthur Mitchell, and Diane Carroll. As Walter notes, the acceptance of Blues in the Night by Southern and African-American artists proved that, quote, categories of popular music were far more permeable than is often claimed. Uh, it sounds like an early crossover artist to me. Walter analyzes and praises both Arlen's innovative tape room songs, as well as his more orthodox 32 bar pieces. To pigeonhole him as a blues writer, as we know, is not only reductive but inaccurate. Not even Blues in the Night is an actual blues. As a performer myself, I, I find the lack of cliche in his writing to be so stimulating and rewarding, if also at times intimidating. He makes the unexpected seem logical and inevitable. And of course, as a singer himself, he knew just how to write for other vocalists. And the jazz musician in me, of course, appreciates that, as we saw, he was not uh, afraid to diverge from his own melodies. By the 70s, Arlen, like Irving Bullock, whom he called practically every day, felt the public and the culture had left him behind after all the gifts he had given them, like a shop owner who suddenly found no one wanted what was on his shelves. Fortunately for Arlen and all of us, jazz and pop musicians and singers revive his older songs with great love, if not always a composer credit. Walter Seitz held Arlen's songbook recordings by pop jazz icons Tony Bennett, Rosemary Clooney, and Peggy Lee, opera divas Eileen Farrell and Sylvia McMiller, nightclub stars Julie Wilson and my wife, Barbara Fasano, and of course, First Lady Ella Fitzgerald, who devoted two LPs to Arlen as she had to Berlin, Porter, and Rogers and Hart. Nonetheless, it frustrated him that his later work was given so little attention, and that, plus illness, his and wife Anya's, made him a depressive recluse for the last quarter century of his life. Harold Arlen put his unique voice and artistry ahead of the marketplace and lifted his art form off the Tin Pan Alley assembly line. And I'm happy to say that before rock and roll changed everything, he was rewarded for it by an American public that somehow defied Mencken's dictum about American taste and embraced his brand of art music. In Walter, he has found his ideal advocate and whisperer. I'll leave the last word on the originality of Harold Allen, not to Walter, nor even to Harold himself, but to a friend and fan called Marlena Dietrich. You try it. You can't find a bond reminiscent of anything you've heard before. He doesn't even steal from himself. The rich don't have to. Here's a brief demonstration of the Arlen originality as I repair to my comfort zone. One song from Harlem from the works by Harburg and Mercer. We'll put it on. Mm -hmm. When the abandons an empty kettle, he should be on his metal, and yet I'm torn apart. Just because I'm presuming that I could be Kind of human if I only have 
I'd be tender, I'd be gentle, and of the sentimental regard love. I be friends with the sparrows and the boy that shoots the arrows if I only had a heart. Picture me. Above, a voice sings above. Wherefore thou wrote me I hear How sweet just to register emotion. Jealousy, devotion, and they feel the power. Stay young and chipper, and I'd rock it with the zipper if I only had a home. And perhaps I deserve you and be even worthy. You, if I only had a heart. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Real and easy, that's my style. How did do me? Watch me smile. Fare thee well, me after all. So I got a and any place I have my house. So, eaten in water, cherry water, thank you kindly, suits me fine. Kansas City, Carolina, that's my honeycomb. And any place I have my hands. Birds roosting in the tree, pick up and go, and they're going through. That's how it could be. I pick up to when the spirit moves me. Cross the road, the bend. Howdy, stranger. So long, friend. There's a voice in the lonesome wind keeps whispering, Rome. Is no matter where that is, there's any place, any place, any place I have. Thank you. Thank you. Very hard. Um, wow. Thank you so much. 
all of you for these amazing um, comments. And I'll, I'll, I'll keep this brief um, because there might be questions and stuff. Um, hearing Eric play and um, an artist of his caliber is, is such a treat. I don't know whether you picked up that he, you know, his introduction quoted Blues in the Night. And I believe the first one you were quoting um, don't so, like yeah, don't like a bias from uh, House of Flowers. He was that in, uh, so wow, <laughs> amazing. Uh, um, and and uh, Eric's comments in hearing a perform uh, points up or, or reinforces one of the I guess the challenges I faced in the book or tried to recognize which you know when I said that Arlen's songs are not just his but there's um, you know the the whole performance tradition of the American Songbook where that song that we just heard, Free and Easy, um, I mean, the harmonies that Eric put under that melody, quite different from the ones that Arlen wrote down, or, but, you know, totally um, in the spirit of, uh, uh, and sort of expanding on those, that is that is one of the things I love about the American Songbook, which is in many ways a unique repertory in that regard. I mean, if you did that with Mozart, um, you know, you'd raise a few eyebrows, changing the harmonies like that. Um, but this is if you do it with Richard Rogers, even if you do it with Richard Rogers. Um, so I do talk about in this book. I mean, I I don't dwell on it for long, theoretically, but I talk about this uh, replicative um, that that the, the quoting Brian Kane, the scholar, that um, the American Songbook is a replicative kind of art where it's um, constantly reinvented by performers versus a realist. He says replicative versus realist. A, a realist approach sort of recognizes a song as an object, something that's there that's more fixed, whereas a replicative approach or understanding acknowledges the, the you know the constant the way that each performer uh, will <clears throat> reinvent the uh, the material. And so that was so wonderfully um, shown by um, Eric. The other thing, the, the the comment about Mozart, um, that actually came from a Sondheim quote um, that in his interview with one of his interviews with uh, Mark Horowitz from the Library of Congress, he said, well, you know, analyzing a song by Kern or uh, Arlen, his two favorite composers, Sondheim, it's really not that different from analyzing, say, the Mozart 39th Symphony, exactly, uh, just... Uh, a rung above or, you know, the, the same, I can't remember what he says, something, but sort of an equivalent. And, and I just say, well, maybe not exactly the same as analyzing the Mozart 39 symphony. And I do, I mean, that it was a challenge I, and I think many people who write about this repertory face, um, uh, yeah. Um, do I think, you know, when the sun comes out is as great as Mozart's 39 symphony. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that that question is, is that meaningful because in their own way they're they're each great works of art and um it's interesting in an early draft of the book uh first sent to norm um and in, uh, in response to it and um, i i had many more references to classical music in there like schubert like certain things that schubert does in his songs that Aaron does in his songs and the reader who is not very friendly in many ways i don't know who it was said well you know but uh you know why do you have to compare it to Schubert or Brahms or you know whatever? Um, um, you know, or in late style, I had more examples from late style, the, which Elaine has written about, and Beethoven at the concept that has been very current in a lot of literary and musical studies. And but I, I actually did. I took all of that out, and I thought this reader was right in a sense. Why should I have to compare Arlen to Mozart or Schubert or whatever? Um, so that's an interesting thing, and. Um, uh, the, um, I, I I just wanted also to appreciate the comment that um, if I ever get to do another edition, the comment that Bob made about Arlen's approach to the blues, which is so central, and yet you know he was always labeled as a blues composer, which he sort of didn't like, or as a jazz composer, um, uh, which he was in some sense. But the fact that in Arlen's blues there is a kind of sadness and sunniness i never when you read all those titles one after the other when the sun comes out my shining hour i know that's not bluesy like song and some of the other ones i thought wow 
there is that what you call playfulness and positive um this sort of um duality in in and um yeah certainly arlen's a, one of the things i tried to say is, so blues in the night this great song of arlen actually takes several 12 bar blues and puts them together and he, he said when he got this commission to write the song called blues in the night or which he called blues in the night and then they changed the name of the film to match that song he thought well you know, everybody says I'm a blues composer, but I've never actually written a blues. This was in 1940. So he said, what am I going to do? He actually got a book by W.C. Handy and, um, you know, sort of studied blues. And then he, um, and what he came up with was Blues and I. But so many of his other songs have blues-like elements, which I tried to unpack a little bit with the help of some people in this room is Rebecca. Rebecca Zola, she's a great uh, ethno student who's a great analyst of jazz, harmonies to see um, when is this really a blue note or is it mixolydian or whatever? I mean, there, there's such great ambiguity in his harmonic style uh, that, and the blues plays into it. Maybe the final thing I'll say is, oh, two things. One is when you, um, one of you was talking about um, what songs meant to the earlier generation or the context. This is just by the by, but Rose Sabotnik has a wonderful article called My Father's Song Wilk or My Father's Song Chest. It's a, where she talks about her father who was a, uh, you know, in the 1920s and 30s and his relationship to Tin Pan Alley song as a Jewish man in, uh, in the East Coast. So it's a wonderful um, contextual, well, really unusual study in that way. But the, the other thing I wanted to say, and what was it? Um, uh, wait, it'll come to me. Um, oh, the Jewish. Um, yeah, so I, I quote Arlen. His father was a cantor and a prominent cantor in Buffalo, New York, and then Syracuse. And his father, um, and there were some recordings uh, of his father singing, which unfortunately, Bill Ecker is here, one of the people who, <laughs> they disappeared um, when Arlen's sister-in-law's estate. We have a tape. I haven't heard it yet. It's at the Evo Institute, which I haven't heard yet. Um, he was a recognized uh, cantor, uh, was uh, Samuel Arlen. So I look forward to hearing those. What I was going to say is that um, Arlen often talked about how when Arlen's tunes became very popular, his father would improvise on them in the synagogue, you know, and and people just loved it. And they thought, you know, um, this was great. So there there is a connection. And in my book, I was a little hesitant to sort of pin it down. There's a writer named uh, Jack Gottlieb who said, oh, yes, well, come rain or come shine with the repeated notes. That's just like this piece of Jewish liturgical chant. Um, I felt that was like a little too pat. Um, but Arlen himself um, said that, you know, hearing his father sing and he sang in his father's shul um, did have a profound influence on him and um, and then vice versa, apparently, with his father's singing. So I think those were the main things I wanted to say, and just so grateful for all the comments that um, that um, my panelists have offered. Thank you. We have time for some questions, but Bob would like to say. Just in the briefest, Reading about Arlen and his father uh, made me remember that Louis Armstrong was a Catholic, uh, and Hol Billy Holiday too. Both of them Catholics, and when Billy was um, incarcerated, it was in a Catholic girls' home. Hmm. So seven days a week, she was hearing these Gregorian chants. Wow, and uh. uh Louis too in, in, in the church in New Orleans. And we need to think more about that kind of uh, spiritual spiritual imp uh, impact of the music or and but also the forms that they were hearing day after day. Well, Armstrong wore a Jewish star and I wonder if the Karnofskys had any cantillation in the house, I've no mm. idea. <laughs> yeah, he says he was aware of that music and loved the Karnofskys and would sing Jewish lullabies to the baby as part of his duties. So I don't know what he meant by that, but there he was. Definitely yeah. to be pursued, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the book sounds fantastic, uh, Walter. Um, and I can't wait to go home now and listen to all the songs. That's what I'll do tonight. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you about um, 
when Alan was writing the song, whether he was given the words and then wrote the melody to them, whether the words were changed according to his rather idiosyncratic way of producing a melody with the harmonies. How did that work for him? So um, as he, as you often said, he worked all kinds of different ways. Um, sometimes there was the idea of a song, like the idea of the rainbow, and then he goes and writes over the rainbow, and then the lyrics are put to it. Um, uh, most often, he wrote the music first, and then the lyrics, the lyrics came. Uh, there were some, a few cases where he set um, pre-existing ly or lyrics uh, to music, um, but most often he wrote the music, and then the lyrics. And, and I quote a number of people: Ira Gershwin. Um, Johnny Mercer, uh, um, Harburg saying, or Ira Gershon says, Arlen is no 32 bar man. Often you have to struggle to figure out, you know, what kinds of words to put to these tunes, but it, you know, it always proves to be the right thing. So very, and then I interviewed Martin Charnin, one of the last people that he worked with in the lyrics is Martin Charnin, better known for, best known perhaps for Annie, writing Annie. <clears throat> Arlen worked with Martin Charnin in the 60s, a kind of reinvigorated him and they worked they wrote a lot of songs for this musical that never was produced softly and charnan told me he said oh he said harold was uh one of the greatest spaghetti writers of all time you know he just sort of you'd have these tunes but you know you'd, you'd figure out a way to um to accommodate your lyrics to them so it worked both ways and then sometimes arlen had what are called trunk tunes tunes that he had sitting around for a while <laughs> that he um would try but one of his most famous it was actually his favorite of his own songs called last night when we were young truly really miraculous song he had that sitting around for a while and he, he kept trying to get some lyricists interested in it and even his composer friends jerome kerr and gershwin in hollywood said oh this is too complex nobody will be but harberg wrote that amazing lyric to last night when we were young um which existed as a song um and so it, it really went both ways. But, you know, like he said in that interview, happy wedding, I know he emphasized that very often, and um, was his ideal. Let me just say one thing is I, I reproduced this uh, one I, um, thing from, uh, he kept a tablet when he was writing House of Flowers with Truman Capote. Truman Capote, who really had no experience writing lyrics and really respected Arlen. So they would sit together in Arlen's apartment working on and and arlen is co-credited with the lyrics for the music class of flowers um and um a lot of the beautiful poetic imagery clearly comes from capote i saw this when i looked at the capote papers at the new york public library but there's one um i think it was i never have seen snow that song that was mentioned by kevin um well arlen you know it just wasn't right and so he sort of takes matters into his own hands and on this tablet it was like an artist tablet I have the reproduced it in my book. He sort of puts the lyrics and then he he puts a few lines of music. It's not even a music manuscript paper. And he's figuring out how to make the transition back to the return, you know, what what words to use. And he came up with those. I, I find that one of the most moving documents, you know, this is Arlen the Craftsman working as a lyricist himself there to kind of get things right. Um, so it was both ways. But again, that the fact that he could work all these different lyricists so different and sort of get in tune with them. It's, I mentioned this in, in the book that um, I think it's very special because some of the great composers, you know, uh, Julie Stein, Irving Berlin, well, Irving Berlin wrote his own lyrics. Um, those who worked with different lyricists, um, often you can't tell the difference in style. I mean, um, a Julie Stein song will sound the same in some ways, whether he's writing with Sondheim or Bob Merrill or other various people he worked with words, mm -hmm. and of course, Rogers and Hart and Rogers and Hammerstein, that were very different. But really, uh, with Arlen, um, he, the style, if you will, changes with each lyricist in a way that I think is really special in the American Songbook. That was a very long answer, sorry. <laughs> and some of these jots and, and lyrics, the are reproduced in the book, which is so wonderful, including a piece of Cotton Club stationery. Yes, the uh, the lyrics for oh, John Reddick. Hi, John. <laughs> do you think you were talking about the marriage between the lyricist and the composer? But do you think you saw marriages also between the performers? Um, in terms of thinking about 
feeling uh, some sort of joy in the fact that it's going to be different in different hands in terms of who sings it and performs it and not ritual like everyone has to kind of sound the same but they have a meeting with the song that everybody can kind of make it their own oh yes i do it's, it would be a short answer and if you look listen to some of those recordings i mean some of the great recordings the uh the way in which these singers you know um if that's what you mean sort of interact with the song as a special um quality and you know not everybody can sing those songs or sings them very well. I mean, they're they're hard. <laughs> they're often very chromatic and complicated. And but when you know, once you know, if a Ella Fitzgerald or a Audra McDonald, um, I mean, it's just so interesting that earlier in their, I mean, Barbara Streisand. If you if you read her autobiography, it's the the whole early part of it. I mean, she talks about how important. I mean, a sleep and be what she made her, but then she on all her early albums, there's these Arlen songs. And in fact, Barbara Streisand's very first album, the liner note on the back is an encomium from Harold Arlen. I mean, it's just a big note. So, you know, you better listen to the singer, you know, 1962, um, Harold Arlen. It's that's the entire liner note for the Barbara Streisand album, I think the first one. So the way these singers and Order of McDonald as well, um, a bunch of her early albums you could put together um, an Arlen album from those. So um, certain singers, yeah, that really obviously relate to his songs in very special ways. Oh. Hannah. Hello. Hi. Thank you, Walter. I can't wait to read the book. Mm -hmm. Thank you to the panel. I was just wondering a bit more about the um tapeworm approach and um yeah is it improvisatory is it flexible how does it shift and change depending on the song and how does that device relate to the setting of words as well yeah no that's interesting uh, most of the tapeworms were musically driven i think and then the lyricists had to sort of figure it out that it was his term it's it's not a really great term it's kind of gooey but also it implies you know sort of that it's continuous in this. And that what it really is with Arlen is adding a section of eight bars or 16 bars or going in extra 12 bars. I mean, they do tend to be in four, eight, 12 bar units, but they go on longer. Uh, so it's it's not like through composed, we might say. Um, uh, he has these sections in it in the quote that one of you read that he said to Jablonski, I wasn't trying to be different. You know, it's just, I felt it needed another eight or 16 bars or whatever. So, um, uh, that's a sort of compositional, oh, yes. And I, I, I think it probably does have to do with an improvisatory impulse. Again, he was a, a jazz uh, arranger and pianist and singer. Um, uh, I see maybe the jazz impulse more in two things. I mentioned in Stormy Weather, where he has these two bar breaks, four bar breaks that were very common in the 1920s. And then in his singing, um, when he sings, we heard it a bit in The Man That Got Away. And I have some other examples in the book. I compare various recordings of um, Paper Moon, I think, where it's, I mean, amazing what he does vocally with uh, with the melody in terms of improvisation. And he doesn't expand it. He doesn't extend it past, you know, the, 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 the number of measures that it is. But that improvisatory element um, in his singing you know, is where I see it. And and the uh, the tapeworms, yeah, and it's somehow more, this needs another eight bars or I need to come back or if I want to end on that high D and <laughs> on the ninth in uh, Happiness is Just a Thing Called Joe, I need to, you know, go back and repeat another bar, you know, something like that. So maybe more compositional, if you will, talking to one of our great composers, Hannah Kindle. So <laughs> she knows about composition. Well, I just wanted to mention too. If it's, it's um, in your travels, did you uh, come across um, wrote a series of, uh, I think, five spirituals? Yes, and uh, the music's out of print. I was able to get that, but um, he, you talked about, you know, he was he wasn't cliche, but he he studied these forms, and it, it there's a photo by somebody that just said it's, you know just authentic 
Right. So in in around 1940, he got together again with uh, Ted Kohler, lyricist that he worked in college, and he wrote this thing called the America Negro Suite, a set of five songs, uh, which published in a quite a beautiful edition. Maybe that's the one you have with illustrations by Botkin. And um, uh, in a way, I mean, I say this in the book, and I also lean on um, the musicologist Nate Sloan, who's uh, working on a wonderful book about Arlen and the Cotton Club, or the Cotton Club, that um, in a way, those songs, yes, they're spirituals and, and Kohler wrote the lyrics, but they're not, they don't quite have the same quality, if that's the word, of the Cotton Club songs, or even the kind of quasi-spirituals, the Broadway spirituals that they wrote earlier on. It's like they're trying too hard in the American Negro Suite, which has been recorded, um, uh, to, and it's worth listening to. And it's, I mean, the piano parts are written out. I mean, it's it's you know a song cycle in a way. Uh, but it it, which is interesting that it, it the, the, those songs don't have the same what uh, impact or quality as uh, Ill Wind or Stormy Weather or some of the songs from the Cotton Club, but the American Negro Suite, yeah. Uh, Kevin wanted to say uh, something. Yeah, well, I just wanted to mention briefly about Harlan's own vocal abilities, right, where he steps in in Diane Carroll's recording, right, because she has a cold and she can't hit the high note, and he hits the high note. <laughs> she had a great, still had a great falsetto. Yeah, if you listen to the original cast album of House yeah. of Flowers and you listen, like my love is to me that like... Is Arlen? <laughs> yeah, that was very careful. Yeah, but but you can, once you hear it, you can you, hear you it. always hear it. Uh, yeah, I, uh, he he did have a tremendous taste in lyricists. But did you get a sense? Did he ever have any kind of envy of her colleagues who did both? You know, like Irving Berlin or Cole Porter, Sondheim, or people? Do you know? I, I never think I'm the music guy. Right. No. Um, well. I, I, you know, as he said in that interview, even though he is the music guy, he, you know, is defers is not the right, you know, the 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 uh, humility to talk about. Because when I hear dee da dee da 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 da, I'm happy with that. I mean, I'll I'll put the lyrics to it too. I mean, it's a great melody in its own right. But you know, he says it needed Harburg's lyrics. Um, no, I never detected any envy. I mean, he, you know, when it came like in House of Flowers, he stepped in and helped with the lyrics, and then. Very late in life, well, I mean, in the 70s, he, he wrote music and lyrics for it, what was going to be a television musical called Clippity Clop and Clementine. Um, and it, it, he didn't, I think he wrote six or seven songs for it. Um, so he did write lyrics there. But I never um, got a sense of him envying the people who, envy is just, not, I mean, I quote him, like Walter Cronkite pushes him a bit in the interview. Or I can't remember you know, about Irving Berlin, and he says Irving Berlin became an American icon, and Gershwin became an American icon because Rhapsody in Blue and other things, and he, he doesn't, you know, there there's no envy there. In fact, Gershwin was sort of, you know, he sort of worshipped, and Gershwin greatly respected Arlen and was a, a mentor to him in a way as well, George Gershwin, um, but I never got the sense of him being envious of writing, uh, of, you know, Irving Berlin and Cole Porter in that way. Yeah. Uh, Bob? Uh, first, I want to say again how wonderful it was to hear you perform this song. Thank you very much, tremendous tree. Um, I, I bet many of us have favorite versions sung by favorite people here. Um, this, in my case, um, my favorite versions of two or three Arlen songs are sung best by Johnny Hodges mm -hmm. and Ben Webster. Those are the ones that I absolutely can't live without, as much as Ella is Ella. But um, I, I wonder if you, if you might say another word about instrumentalists who've done things with these these songs that are unbelievable. You mean instrumentalists singing or playing? No, no oh. uh, Johnny singing through the alto saxophone. Maybe mm -hmm. you're. Uh, okay. Place, let's fall in love, and you'll never forget it. Yeah. Um. In, in the Rainbow Book, I have a chapter on pianists who um who played uh the Arlen Songbook, and uh, yeah. Um. That, I don't know the Johnny Hodges version, or, or can't call it up, but Bob has shared with me many great recordings over the years. Um. Uh. Yeah. I mean, 
some of the great instrumentalists, they sing, you know, as well. I mean, you get the feeling that they're singing. That's probably a poor answer, but um, uh, some of the people that I talk that's about. Yeah, yeah. I in the Rainbow Book, I decided not to go with vocalists and just go with pianists because, well, a lot of vocalists steered clear of Over the Rainbow, um, uh, because of the comparison with Judy Garland. I mean, Barbara Streisand said, "Well, you know, I avoided it for years because, of course, there's Judy." But then she sang it once or twice. So, uh, and then um, there have been great recordings of it since. Well, if you've heard Frank Sinatra sing last night when we were young, was it one wonderful colloquium you gave? You played that. I'd never heard anything like it. And I'm not a Sinatra fan, but it was tremendous. I think we're out of questions. So I think we just should have, pay tribute to the panelists, to Walter Frisch. And Thank to you. Thank you.